we'll make sure we answer them and discuss them. Okay, YouTube is thinking about it. <laughs> All right, so we're live on YouTube. Um, Sherelle, do you want to take it away? Absolutely. Well, hello. Welcome to the first edition of our thematic 2021-2022 Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series, our series. With this series of free public presentation, the Lunar and Planetary Institute strives to connect the public to exciting planetary and space science research. This year, the theme of our speaker series is devoted to exploring the universe with the James Webb Space Telescope. Throughout the winter and spring, we'll be hosting five presentations focusing on the scientific mission of the James Webb Telescope from studying birth of stars to searching for signs of life on distant planets. Today, we're happy to have our very own Associate Director, Dr. Walter Kiefer, here to deliver the first of these exciting presentations. Tonight, He'll be introducing us to this groundbreaking telescope and its amazing mission. Before we begin the presentation, we have a couple of poll questions that we'd like for you to respond to. Grace, please launch a poll question. Yes. So first off, we have these two questions. You might have to scroll down to see them. The first question is, have you ever attended one of LPI's Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series events before tonight? We wanna to know if you're new. If you have, maybe you've attended virtually or in person, please let us know. If you're new, please let us know, or maybe you're not sure. If you scroll down the second question, we wanna know how familiar you are or how aware you are of the JWST or James Webb Space Telescope and its scientific mission. Do you feel very aware? moderately aware, somewhat, not very, or what's the James Webb? <laughs> so I'm gonna give you all a couple more seconds and then we're gonna close the poll. All right, so three, two, one. And I'll show you all the results. So we have a lot of returners. Thank you, a couple new people. We're so glad to have you here. And it looks like we've got a good spread in people's awareness of the James Webb. So that's great. There's a lot that we're gonna learn tonight. I have one more poll. And this one is to just get an idea of who you are. This is helpful for us to figure out how we can improve the reach of our programs and the audiences that we're serving. So we'd like to know which of these best describes you. Are you a scientist, educator, student, amateur astronomer, science enthusiast, a local community member near Houston, a national community member, or maybe you're an international community member, and you can select more than one option. So there's a lot of things to pick from here. I'll give you all a few more seconds. All right, thanks for your participation. I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one and show you the results again. We've got a big spread in people. We're so glad to have you here tonight. All right, so without any further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it back to Sherelle. So, well, thank you all for your participation. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome the director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute, Dr. Lisa Gaddis, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. Dr. Gaddis, take us away. Thank you, Sherelle. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. And it's my pleasure to introduce Walter Kiefer tonight. Um, Dr. Kiefer's educational background includes a Bachelor of Science in 1984 in Physics and Astronomy from Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas, a Master of Science in 1986 in Planetary Science from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, or otherwise called Caltech, and a PhD in 1990 in planetary science and geophysics at Caltech. After a term as a NASA Research Council Associate at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland from 1990 to 93, Dr. Kiefer came to the LPI where he was recently appointed the Associate Director as, as you've heard. Walter's research interests at the LPI focus on the internal structure and thermal evolution of the terrestrial planets. 
Dr. Kiefer is a co-investigator of the deep atmosphere Venus investigation of noble gases, chemistry, and imaging, also called Da Vinci. Uh, this is a mission that will explore Venus in the late 2020s as part of NASA's discovery program. Walter was also a member of the science study team that defined the joint European Space Agency and NASA mission called Envision, which is an orbital remote sensing mission to Venus. Walter is also co-investigator on the gra gravity and radio science team for the Europa Clipper mission. And he was previously a science team member for NASA's GRAIL mission, studying the moon's deep crust, a crust and deep interior. The fascinating, most powerful telescope in space is the topic of Walter's talk tonight. Walter, we look forward to your presentation this evening. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Can everybody hear me okay? Lisa or Sherelle, can you tell me you're hearing me all right? Yes, sir, loud and clear. Okay, so um, I do want to say at the beginning, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I do want to say at the beginning, this happens to be a very windy night here in Houston, Texas. If you hear noise in the background, it is most likely the wind blowing trees out in my backyard. Um, and so I apologize for that, but hopefully it's not going to be too much of an issue. Um, Why is this not going forward? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and try and restart sharing because it was not advancing for me and that's not a good sign. Oh dear. Um. Walter, do you want to, um, you can stop sharing and then maybe exit presentation mode. And then um, you can share again from the windowed uh, presentation screen. Yeah, that may be what I have to do. And I will try and minimize that um, as best I can. So we'll try this again. Thank you, Grace. It can get a little finicky with the screen sharing and the presentation mode. I've had right. that happen. Okay, we'll try it that way. Okay. This is not good. No, it is not. It, it let me do this in rehearsal. So, yes, okay, is. this is not encouraging. And I apologize, people. Grace or Sherelle, can you, one of you, um, run the slides from your side? And I will just ask you to advance it because... My controls are just completely locked, and I do not understand why. Absolutely. Um, I can bring that up right now. All right. How's that look for everybody? Not there yet. Oh, okay. It's, there we go, okay. So go to slide two, please, Grace. Okay, so what I'd like to do um, in the next roughly 30 to 40 minutes is to give you a presentation, of, an overview presentation about what the James Webb Telescope will be doing, its science objectives, how it will perform its job. Um, this is background for a series of talks that we will be um, offering in this series over the next, um, from now until the spring. The next one is just two weeks away. Um, so I, mine, mine is intended to be an overview, but you'll get specific things about particular topics in the um, uh, next, uh, starting in two weeks. So the image here is um, an artist's conception of what the web telescope will look like when it's deployed in space. Now, I have some pictures of it in um, the construction area in uh, uh, where it was built. Uh, but it can only show pieces at a time uh, because this is a very big telescope. Um, the mirror there is six and a half meters, um, about 20 feet across. Um, other pieces, uh, the, the sun shield, the silver thing below the mirror is the size of a tele, uh, tennis court. So this is a very big structure. It can't all be deployed. It's never been deployed all at once to my knowledge. Um, so I have to rely on um, artistic uh, uh, renderings of it. And although we're used to seeing pictures, for instance, of the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit taken by astronauts, we will not have that with Webb. Webb will be deployed um, on a, 
a rocket without humans being involved. Um, and so there will be no pictures of this um, in space showing us what it looks like. So we have to rely on these kinds of pictures. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So, so let me start by talking in any, in any NASA mission, uh, we need to think about what are our science objectives because they control the way we build spacecraft, how we design them, how we operate them um, are, are always structured to, to answer the key science objectives. So the Webb uh, Space Telescope has four science objectives. Foremost is to search for the first galaxies or luminous objects that formed after the Big Bang. Um, that sets certain requirements on the telescope that can then also be used to meet other objectives, um, which are to determine how galaxies evolve from the formation um, of the galaxies to the present day, to, uh, to observe the formation of stars from their first stages of formation to the formation of planetary systems, and to measure the physical and chemical properties of planetary systems and their potential for life. And what I will do now in the next series of slides is I will go through um, typically with two or sometimes three slides for each of these objectives, I'll talk about the science that NASA would like to do, uh, what astronomers would like to do with this telescope. And I will be using, for the most part, Hubble telescope images as, um, as examples. Um, people sometimes describe Webb as the successor to Hubble, and in a way it is, but it does some very different things. Um, and so one really should not think of it as a replacement for Hubble. Um, but rather something that is the next great thing in, um, in space-based astronomy. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we have to know, if we want to look back to the early universe, we have to understand that we live in a universe which is expanding over time. It's what we call the Big Bang. Um, the universe started very small, but over the last 13.8 billion years, it has expanded to the size it is today. As the universe has expanded, space itself is stretching. Um, and the implication of that is that the wavelengths of light also get stretched. That's the point of the graphic, the moving graphic in the um, upper left. Um, think of that, that up and down wave as a, a wave of light um, where things are, it's as time goes on, wavelengths get stretched. And so if we have, um, light that may have started out in the visible to look at, say, stars the way we would with our, our eye and, and that are nearby us. As we look back in time, those are stretched strongly into the infrared. They're stretched by up to a factor of 30. Um, and so what we would look at in the, um, uh, in the visible um, with Hubble, we need to look at into the infrared with, uh, with the James Webb telescope. Uh, and so that's what's shown here in the lower right is the uh, is the spectrum of different types of light. Um, what we see with our eyes is a very small fraction of it. Um, uh, shorter than, than blue would be ultraviolet. Those are the waves that cause you to get sunburns. And then even shorter wavelengths would be x-rays and gamma rays. Um, and then longer, longer wavelengths than red would be infrared. That's what the Webb telescope will be optimized for. And then microwave and radio waves, very long waves, um, are, are even longer yet. So you can only, you have to pick what you wanna work on and that's how they picked what Hubble would do. Um, next slide, please. So the first uh, of the four uh, objectives is to understand, um, to look back in time to as close as we can to the time of the Big Bang and to understand the initial formation of the universe. Um, what did the first galaxies look like? or or as, as you saw there, you may have thought it was strange. Well, what did the first luminous objects look like? Because you know, we, we assume that they're galaxies, but you know, we're, we're, they may not look like galaxies at present. So we're going to look back to see what we can see as far away as we can look. Um, and the illustration here is, um, is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, Hubble has over its um, time in space, which is now past 30 years, it was designed to work for 15, um, but with the help of five servicing missions by uh, astronauts on the space shuttle, um, the, uh, it's, it's worked for 31 years. This is looking in a, a part of the sky that has very few stars in it. So you can look back and see um, galaxies at many different distances. Um, and so, and, and they did this um, 
a number of different times because as they put new instruments on Hubble and expanded its capabilities, they always look back with the new instruments that either looked at new wavelengths or with, uh, with higher sensitivity. Uh, so there have been multiple versions of this. This particular image has something like 10,000 galaxies in it. And that's probably not obvious to you, uh, but, but the people who have studied it uh, closely say that that's the correct number. Um, and then the next slide, please. This is just a random blow up of a piece of it. Uh, you're now looking at small things that are mostly galaxies here. There are some stars here. Um, the one in the upper center, for instance, that seems to have the, the red kind of X across it is almost certainly a foreground star. But, but many of these things here are galaxies of different types. They may be elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, irregular galaxies. And remember, we're looking back in time as we look at these. Um, and the James Webb, because it will look in the infrared, will go look even deeper. So we will be able to look at galaxies forming uh, within the first 200 million years of the age of the universe. Now, our understanding of the Big Bang, based on measurements we have made from a number of NASA spacecraft like the Cosmic Background Explorer and the micro microscope, Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP, um, tell us that the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, we can actually use that, that spacecraft data to pin down the time of the Big Bang with, with a high degree of precision. Uh, the James Webb will be able to look back to about 13.6 billion years ago based on the wavelengths it can see. In other words, we're seeing back 98.6% of the way from the present day back to the Big Bang with this telescope. And I think that's really kind of remarkable. And so we'll be looking um, for what do these galaxies look like in, these very, in this very distant part of the universe and then galaxies at different times. So let's go then to the next slide, please. So in terms of understanding um, galactic evolution, which is the second objective, we, we obviously can't look at any given galaxy except at one moment in time. But what we can do is to look at galaxies at different distances and therefore at different um, times of life. And we can actually gauge the distance from that redshift. Um, we can actually use that to characterize how far back any particular thing is. Uh, and I don't have time to go into the specifics of how it's done, but but take me, believe me, that that is actually something astronomers have known how to do for about a hundred years. Um, so this is an example of a of a spiral galaxy. Our our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy as well, but we can't tell its structure as well because we're inside it. So we're looking outside of the Milky Way, and this is this a nearby galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's it's a, got a spiral shape. You understand where that name comes from. The colors are meaningful. Um, the white and yellowish in the center and in some of the arms of the galaxy, that reflects many stars of different sizes, different colors. Um, uh, the, uh, our sun is a, is a relatively typical star. It's a yellow star. Um, and that's the kind of older stars you see here in this. Then there's a set of bright blue objects that define parts of the spiral arms. These are um, large, hot uh, stars. Um, the fact that they're, they're, the large stars can power um, nuclear reactions more rapidly, that makes them hotter. The hotter color then turns into blue. And because they are blue, because, they're, because they are um, high temperature, they use their fuel up very rapidly. So these stars um, that define the spiral arms in many cases are less than 10 million years old because they go very quickly and then they're going to, um, in some cases, go supernova and go extinct. Um, and then you think, well, then the galaxy is gonna die, but no, not really, because you see a lot of um, red material there. All of those discrete red patches are clouds of hydrogen, uh, which uh, then can be driven into additional epochs of star formation and will be as the arms move around. And then finally, there's the dark lanes of material, which show up mostly as obscuring things behind it. Those are uh, lanes of dust. Um, and Hubble, not, excuse me, not Hubble, Webb and its wavelengths will be able to see through that. Um, the other thing here is that there is a bright, uh, a second bright structure on the in the upper right, which is um, an irregular galaxy. It's near the Whirlpool galaxy. It is interacting gravitationally with it. And you can see it is um, starting to bend some of these arms. Or, 
the spiral, particularly the ones closest to it, is kind of bent. It's not the same shape as you would kind of expect. It's got a kink in it. Um, so this is an indication of galaxies that are interacting. That's something we'll want to understand too. And let's in fact go to the next slide, please. So um, early in the universe, when things were more densely packed together, galaxies were closer and on average, they would have interacted more often. So you we will expect to see colliding galaxies. And this is an example of relatively near pair of such galaxies. The um, Again, when, you, when I say colliding galaxies, I don't think of galaxies hitting each other where stars hit each other. Space, even in the middle of galaxies, is mostly empty. So these are not going to hit each other in a physical sense, but rather their gravity will distort each other. Um, you can already see that in the arms here. Um, and probably eventually these will end up as a single larger elliptical galaxy. So what we will do looking back in time is to understand um, how did the structure of galaxies change at different times? Were there always spirals? Were they always the size that we see today? Um, what was the nature of uh, the rate of star formation in some of these at different times based on the, the colors, the red and the blue and so forth? Um, appropriately red shifted and counting for the, the, the distances. Um, so we, we will use looking back in time as a time machine for understanding in a statistical sense the evolution of galaxies because we only see one frame for any particular galaxy. We see where it is as it is right now or as it is at the time the light left it, which is at different times. Um, next, please. So the third objective is to understand um, star formation and in particular understand um, the nature of um, formation of planetary systems. So I picked this one and I picked all of these pictures in a sense because they illustrate science stories, but also because they're frankly, they're beautiful. The, I, I find these kinds of pictures just stunning. And when you get as many pixels in them as Hubble provided and as Webb will provide, you can make these big prints of basically art on your wall if you happen to be a science aficionado. And this, this the Orion Nebula is a, a patch of, um, gas and dust visible. The Orion uh, constellation Orion is visible in the night sky. You can find it tonight if you look in the right place. Uh, many of you may be familiar with it. Um, if you're not and you happen to go to a star party at some point where astronomers have tele amateur astronomers have telescopes out, um, anytime between now and late spring, um, I bet you can probably talk one of the astronomers into showing you this in um, in their telescope because it's a nearby relatively easy object. It will not look this stunning. This is something you can do with cameras that integrate light over time. Your eye will never do that well, um, but nonetheless, you can. this is something you can see with the aid of a small telescope or even if you know where you're looking with binoculars. Um, and buried in this, this is a relatively young cloud of gas, um, a, a nebula, um, and we know that there is star formation going in there. And so the next slide, shows um, Hubble views of four of these dust disks uh, where things are collapsing. Um, supernovas nearby will create pressure waves in the gas and they will cause small parts of the nebula to start collapsing to form stars and often um, disks of material around it that eventually can form planets. So these are the views of four of these dust disks. Um, some of these will almost certainly be targets for Webb um, there are also other things that have been picked out by other ground-based ground observations, both with um, ground-based visible telescopes, but also with uh, radio wavelength uh, telescopes, uh, particularly a telescope, a radio telescope in South America called ALMA um, can see details in some of these dust disks um, at radio wavelengths. And so we have a bunch of targets that astronomers will want to look at, again, to try and understand the detailed structure of these and how do, how do planets start to form in these objects? Um, and Hubble, excuse me, Hubble, not Hubble, Webb, will not only provide high resolution looking into it, but it will be able to look at wavelengths um, that will be diagnostic of some of the structure, the chemical composition. Um, and um, so, so th this will be, uh, oh, and the, the, uh, the other important thing is that, uh, that Webb, because it looks in the infrared, uh, you can see through the dust sometimes. And so, whereas the dust clouds obscure things for Hubble, 
um, in many cases, uh, Web will be able to see through it. So let's go to the next slide, which illustrates that point. So this is um, a picture of a dust pillar in the Carina Nebula, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the picture on the right is at visible wavelengths. Um, the different colors illustrate different types of uh, different uh, elements in the gas cloud. And I can't tell you which elements are illustrated by which color. Um, some of you may remember a picture that came from Hubble, one of its famous early pictures um, called the Eagle Nebula. Uh, was called the Pillars of Creation back when it was first imaged in 1995, I believe. This looks similar to it. It is not that area. Uh, it's something that does look similar. And I picked this particular one, again, partly because it is beautiful, um, at least beautiful if you're a, a, a scientist that wants to understand the sky, um, but also because this picture, this, this um, nebula was imaged uh, in additionally in the infrared, and those longer wavelengths of light can see through the dust. And so compare, this is exactly the same frame at exactly the same scale. And in the left-hand picture, you can really not see it. It's mostly opaque. And in the right-hand picture, there are stars you can see right through the dust. So the different wavelengths will give us a perspective on the structure of these nebula um, that, and the star, the star formation process, the planet formation process that we have never had before. So that's a, another, a third important objective of uh, the Webb telescope. And the fourth and final, let's go to the next slide. The fourth and final objective is to understand the, um, the planets, planets in our solar system, but also um, uh, looking at things like perhaps exoplanets, actual planets that have formed around um, uh, other stars, uh, which is, I guess, connected to the previous objective. And in some cases, to actually to, to potentially be able to assess the possible presence of life on those worlds. So let me again explain that. Um, these are a pair of pictures of Neptune taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, our very best views of Neptune were taken, of course, by Voyager. The Voyager 2 spacecraft in 1989 um, got very close to, um, to Neptune. It, took, it left Earth in August of 19. 77, it took 12 years to get to Neptune and is now on its way out of the solar system. So for a few days in late August of 1989, we had a really great view of the weather on, on Neptune. But after that, you can't do so well from telescopes on the ground, but Hubble, because it's above the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere, um, Hubble can actually get a much better view. And so this shows clouds um, and the different colors, these are not necessarily true colors. In fact, almost all of it is not true color, um, but the colors were picked to show to different depths. Uh, the blue is probably the actual blue of the most of Neptune, um, which is because methane absorbs at a certain altitude, but the other colors were picked um, to absorb at different heights in the atmosphere. So we can start to see structure in the clouds. Um, we'll be able to do something similar with Webb. We'll be able to extend our, our knowledge of the meteorology of um, planets like Uranus and Neptune um, into the future. Uh, let's go with the next slide, please. And, and you might think it's really strange that I tell you that it might be possible with Webb to determine the presence of life on planets that we can barely detect, but it might in fact be possible. And this slide is an illustration of how I think we can do that. Um, this is an example of what, a, what scientists call a spectrum. This takes light and splits it out to its different colors. Um, visible is there in the far left of this where it says red. Um, really, Webb will only see red and then things in the infrared, which are what your eye can see, but um, which we can with uh, Webb's detectors. Um, and then at specific wavelengths, at specific um, lengths of light, different molecules will absorb in different ways. So the scale here is written in numbers. It doesn't actually tell you the, um, and it's actually, I guess it's cut off. It's, it's in microns. Now a micron might not be familiar to many of you. It's one millionth of a meter. Or think of it like this. Um, a human hair is about 50 microns across. So 
Um, the five micron point in here near the middle of that picture is one tenth of the width of a human hair. And those different places where I where this shows absorptions could be water. Now, water is an interesting thing to um, um, to, to find because we think, as we understand it, water is needed by every form of life. Uh, we There might be life that doesn't need water, but it's not something we can understand in our Earth uh, laboratories because we have no examples of it. So we look for water as a, a marker where life could happen. Water by itself does not mean life is present. It just means what life might be present. But But what we can do beyond that is we can look for some other common molecules. Carbon dioxide is a common thing in the atmosphere of Venus and Mars, for instance. Um, objects that are dead, we think. Um, if you put oxygen into those atmospheres, it will interact with other gases in the atmosphere and with the surface rocks, um, and the oxygen will be destroyed. It will make carbon dioxide. It will combine with the rocks. So if you see um, signs of molecular oxygen as they're on the um, left-hand side of the um, of the spectrum, uh, that is an indicator uh, that um, something is actively creating oxygen. And we would understand that to be, as on Earth, to be a sign of photosynthesis, where plants take carbon dioxide and with the help of certain types of biology, make oxygen and they can drive themselves. They make sugar in the process too, which is a fuel. Um, and so, so that's a clue that if we see molecular oxygen, there is almost certainly light on that star, on not, not on that star, on that planet. And so the upper right is showing you a, a planet with a, a dark, uh, excuse me, a star with a dark planet orbiting around it. As it goes across in front of it, it takes out some light, but some of the light of the um, star will go through if there's an atmosphere and we will see some of the signature, these dropouts based on where the what's being absorbed in the atmosphere um and the amount of absorption is the up and down on the uh, the y-axis the vertical axis um and and ozone can be it has some specific bands or it, it may have just a broad roll off as it shows there on the on the um, left where it slopes down at the red wavelengths and then we might see methane um methane is another indicator of life um on Earth, um, termites and cows um, are the best uh, producers of methane that I'm aware of. Um, we all biologically make methane um, at some point, but uh, that if you see strong amounts of methane, you might be thinking of something like cow farts. Um, okay, that's a visual image if we have any students that you can remember things, and sometimes that's the best way to remember them. Um, so this pattern of chemical elements that we might see in um, this kind of spectrum is potentially diagnostic of the existence of life. Now, it won't tell us how that life operates. We have to be there physically, and we're not going to be able to do that. But it's it's a great clue that we, and the fact that we can do this from, from a distance is amazing. Well, let's go to the next slide, please. So how are we going to do this? Um, first, why are we going to actually bother to put this telescope into space? Um, the answer to that is that most infrared wavelengths are absorbed by our atmosphere. And so we actually can't do this science from the ground. We have to go in space. Um, and we're picking the mirror. So the, there are two mirrors shown here with a person for size. Um, the, the smaller silver mirror on the uh, lower left is uh, the Hubble mirror, um, the primary mirror, the main mirror, which is about uh, it's about eight feet across. It's about 90, somewhere between 90 and 96 inches. So roughly eight feet. Um, and don't ask me for it in meters. Um, two and a half, 2.4 meters, I believe. Um, the web mirror will be much larger. Um, it's six and a half meters or close to 20 feet across. Um, that is there for two reasons. One is a larger mirror improves the total amount of light that's collected so you can see dimmer objects. But the other is, is that the relationship between the resolution of what you can see, how sharp your image is, is related to the wavelength of light and the size of your mirror. So we're looking at longer wavelengths than Hubble. In order to get an image which is effectively as sharp as Hubble, we need a larger mirror. Um, and so Hubble and Webb will be roughly equivalent in resolution at the wavelengths they operate at. 
Um, so if you think Hubble produces really slick images, I think we can expect that Webb will as well. Um, two other things I'd like to, uh, two other points I'd like to make here. Uh, first is the color. Um, the, the, um, the Hubble mirror is silver. I don't know if it is actually silver or not um, chemically, but it is, it reflects visible light. This, you might say, well, this looks kind of like gold. Well, it is in fact with Webb, it is in fact gold. Um, and that was chosen because um, gold is a very good reflector in the infrared. So we want something that is a very, a, that doesn't absorb any of those light. It reflects it on in the telescope. Uh, so that's why that was chosen. And now you might say, well, gee, is that why Webb costs so much money? And the answer is, well, no. Um, it's a very thin coat. Um, and over this whole structure, it's like 48 grams. The way it's the mass of a golf ball, a little less than two ounces. So Webb is expensive because this kind of engineering is not simple. It's unique engineering, um, and but it's not expensive because they use two ounces of gold. Um, the other thing is notice that the mirror is in segments of, of perfect hexagons, um, and that is done so that each mirror segment can be adjusted slightly with motors on its back to improve the focus. And that, that gives us the capability of if anything happens um, in the stress of launch, it can be adjusted a little bit by astronomers from the ground. So that's why it was built that way. That's part of the reason it was built that way. It actually was also built that way um, for a reason I'll show you in a moment. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the next three slides will tell you about the instrumentation, and then we'll come back to talk more about the telescope itself. Um, the first instrument that I'd like to talk about is something called the near the NIR cam or near infrared camera. Um, this works at wavelengths of from 0.6 to 5 microns. 0.6 is red, your eye can see that. 5 microns is, well, our eye can see out to about 0.7 microns. So it's it's well beyond what your eye can see, but it's what we would call near infrared. Um, there are a bunch of filters there. Um, the, the, the strength of having an imaging system, a camera in effect, um, this is basically a, a big CCD system. And you know, you're know you used to having things like that on your cell phones now. Um, the first CCDs were developed for astronomers in the late 1970s and early 1980s um, because they wanted to develop a new type of imager to use on the Hubble Space Telescope. And now, of course, they're everywhere. Your digital cameras use them, your cell phones use them. They're all over the place, but this is gonna be one honking good um, imaging system. Um, so there are a bunch of filters that will provide some spectral detail, but the camera really is to show the spatial structure. Um, and so for any given area, um, a scientist might say, I wanna study this area, which you know it might be based on a name, but they'd have to give coordinates um, in the sky where they wanna look and um, in this application system, you've got to explain what your science is, and you would stipulate how much, um, what, what filters do you want to use, because you can't use all 29 because that takes too long, you'd never get approved, but you'll pick the ones you need most importantly, um, and you've got to figure out, well, given how bright it's going to be, how much time do you need, and all of this is based on, goes into a decision process of which things can be selected, and typically one out of every about 10 gets selected. Um, so this is a this is a complicated process, and that's true for all of the instruments. It's not just for the camera. Um, there is a coronagraph on this, and that's basically it's got a small disc that occults the central part of this. So if we were looking at a bright star, thinking there might be planets next to it, we can block out the star and look in the area around it. The, if not necessarily planets, but at least the discs around it. And because this is in the infrared, we have to worry about um, the effects of the heat in the spacecraft affecting the image. So there is a sunshade, which I will talk about in a few minutes, that cools the, cools the, um, the spacecraft down to 389 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, or 39 degrees Kelvin. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but that's important because it keeps the, the noise in the detectors down so you're seeing the sky and you're not getting a glow in your detectors from the spacecraft. Next slide, please. Then we also would like to do spectroscopy. Spectroscopy lets us, as I showed in that example, spectroscopy lets us look at, rather than the spatial structure, 
it lets us look at how things, different colors of light vary in terms of their intensity. Um, and so it's a complementary view to the, um, to the images. Um, there are two such spectrometers on, um, on web. One is produced by the European Space Agency um, and, it, and it's contributed. Um, it's actually kind of common in big science, uh, big space science these days that, um, that different countries cooperate in their, um, in their uh, endeavors. Uh, we've got a spacecraft on Mars right now. It's a NASA spacecraft that has um, called InSight that has instruments that were developed in France and Germany that are produ producing important information about Mars. Um, at the beginning, Lisa Gaddis, uh, Dr. Gaddis, our director, told you that one of my jobs in the last few years is to help develop um, the Envision spacecraft, which the European Space Agency will has selected to fly to Venus, but which will include a radar provided by NASA. So this cooperative cooperation between the space agencies of the uh, various uh, Western powers um, is something that happens regularly. And so we, we have a, a, a um, spectrometer provided by the European Space Agency and a second one that has different capabilities provided by the Canadian Space Agency. They both work in the same wavelength band as the near infrared camera. Um, one of the features of the ESA spectrometer is that it can take up to 100 spectra of up to 100 different pieces in that part of the sky at the same time. So these different instruments provide different ways of getting a breakdown between spatial resolution and spectral resolution. The final uh, instrument, next slide please, is what's called the mid-infrared instrument, um, MIRI. Um, and it's called instrument rather than camera or spectrometer because it does both. Um, it, it covers the longer wavelength part of this from about 4.9 microns, which just overlaps with the other instruments. And that overlap is good um, to, to uh, you don't wanna leave gaps in your coverage, um, out to 28.8 microns, which is the longest it can see. And that longer part, um, the, the, reason, the reason you would use this instrument is that you, the long wavelengths um, are the places where the coldest objects will be most visible. So that could be um, that could be objects in the distant part of the, the Earth of our solar system, um, things in the Kuiper belts, um, comets, or um, icy objects out beyond Pluto. Um, we can study with this, for instance. It is also because of the the redshift associated with the Big Bang is the way we will see closest to the time of the Big Bang. As I said, we will get within 1.4 percent um, of the way to the to the Big Bang itself, which is I find remarkable. Um, this particular instrument will have nine filter bands to do imaging. So you could do the structure on the sky, the, the, the spatial structure in nine different colors as it were, um, but it will also be able to do spectroscopy all at once. Um, and I, I chose here, I could have done these kinds of lab pictures of all of the instruments. Um, I just picked this one to give you the sense that these instruments are big, but they are still human scale because you can see the three people there dressed um, for this and that all of these instruments are covered in insulation. That's the silver material um, that's designed to help keep them cold in space, um, to keep their temperature constant. Um, and notice the people who work um, on these um, wear a really careful set of what we call bunny suits. Um, literally the only piece of them that is exposed is their eyes. Um, everything else, anything else on their skin is completely covered over. I'm going to guess this clean room is so intensely clean that they probably go through what's called an air shower to get in there. I don't know that with, um, with certainty. Um, I'm saying that based on my own experiences in the lunar sample lab um, at the Johnson Space Center, which they, they also worry about contamination, but I think they're, they're so worried about contamination here that they probably do something very equivalent in, this, uh, in these kinds of studies. This particular instrument at these longest wavelengths, um, and therefore seeing the coldest structures, um, is especially sensitive to any kind of thermal perturbation by the spacecraft. So this has an active cooler that uses liquid helium that cools the spacecraft to seven degrees above absolute zero, 447 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That is really, really cold. Um, and the expectation is that the lifetime of this instrument, which will be limited by the, cooler, the, the supply of coolant, will be at least five years. The hope is the spacecraft as a whole will last for at least 10, 
And that's probably limited by the maneuvering fuel. Um, and so it, there may be at a certain point where this instrument is no longer available. Um, so they will do all the science that they can with it before they run out uh, of time. And they'll, they'll monitor obviously the, the level of coolant that's available um, to them over time as a part of their planning process. Next slide, please. So here are a pair of um, images showing um, the telescope in the clean room being assembled. Um, this telescope is so large that um, it cannot be in its unfolded form, it cannot be deployed on any existing rocket. The largest such rocket has a what's called a fairing. You might think of it as a nose cone, but it's actually much bigger than just the upper cone. Um, that is a, just under five meters wide. This telescope, the mirror from edge to edge is 6.5 meters. And the, the, uh, the sunshade below it is the size of a tennis court. Um, plus the structure, the, the, the two silver arms that are pointing up as an upside down V that's part of the optical system is, is even bigger than the, um, the telescope itself. So if you, if you tried to launch this in deployed shape, you would need a structure that is a, a rocket that could launch something that is more than 10 meters across, much bigger than we can actually do. So the te this telescope has to be able to um, fold itself into place. Um, and so you can see, for example, on the left side, um, the, the mirror is hinged in three places or in two places at three pieces that are hinged on two sides that will fold into place. And you can see that in the um, upper right. Um, and then below that, the sun shield will have to come out. And let's look at the next slide, please. So, so here you can see the sunshade and you have a person for scale. Basically, there are five layers from the person's feet up to about his waist or he or she, I don't know um, who, who, who that person is. Um, but, you know, figure two and a half feet between those, those structures. Um, and what happens here, so imagine the sun being down in your floor, the sunlight comes up and hits the bottom. It heats up the lower layer of the sun shield and that makes it hot and it radiates some light. And then now you're in the vacuum of space and so it doesn't conduct energy, but the, the, uh, the, the photons that the sun shield will radiate um, will hit the second shade and then the third one. And each time it will cool off a little bit by the time you get to the, the upper shade where the telescope is, the outside, 185 degrees Fahrenheit or 85 degrees Celsius, the cold side, that's the hot side is the bottom side. The cold side on top is now 388 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. So again, this is a change in temperature of about 570 degrees Fahrenheit across that two and a half feet. This again is a key to its development. And that shield is, the sun shield is as big as it is because it has to protect the mirror. It has to actually extend far enough out so that uh, when the, uh, the, the uh, what's called the secondary mirror deploys out on those arms, it's gotta be protected. The instruments um, which are being used are behind the telescope. They've gotta be protected. All of these have to be in the shade of the sun. Let's go to the next slide, please. And it's in fact, not just the shade of the sun we're worried about. Um, if Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope is about 570 kilometers, um, 350 miles up above the, the surface of the earth, um, at a height that astronauts could reach, I wouldn't say easily, it was, it was about the highest the space shuttle ever went, um, but it was something that was in the capability of the space shuttle. It was designed for that purpose. Um, Webb cannot do that. Uh, because we're, they are so worried about the thermal perturbations that it's not just the sun that's important, but it's light coming off the earth, either not necessarily sunlight, but even the dark side of the earth or the dark side of the moon will radiate energy. And if you're too close to them, that will heat the telescope up. So we want to be about a million miles away from earth, um, 1.5 million kilometers. So, so look at the distance. This is one of the reasons why I say Webb is not a replacement for Hubble. It's simply the next generation of um, telescope. Um, and we will be going to a place called L2. It's, a, it's called a Lagrange point. I've, 
um, it's a place in space where the gravity of the of the Earth and the gravity of the Sun about balance out. We've used it for other astronomy satellites before. So we can keep Webb there with relatively little amount of fuel. That's one of its keys to its longevity. Um, and we will be far enough away from the Earth and the Moon that their, their thermal energy does not affect Webb. The sun shield will, uh, will keep the sun light down and that will enable Webb to do what it's going to do. Those are the keys to its success. Um, getting there will take about a month and then fully finishing the deployment of the mirror, of the sunshade, the different parts of the mirror, the focusing, the uh, commissioning of the instruments, all together will take about six months. So let's go to the next slide, please, which I think is the last one. Oh, not quite, one more. Um, so leave it here for a second. Um, this again is an artist view and it shows where some of the things are. You get a better view of what's going on on the bottom. Um, the antenna will point since, since the bottom is, oh, since the bottom part of the sunshade is always pointing at the sun, um, and we're orbiting the Earth, we will always, given where we will be, we, that antenna will always point back at Earth as well. Um, and the, the part, the instrumentation that operates the spacecraft will be down there. There is um, a solar panel to generate uh, power down there. The navigation and control system is down there. The um, instruments are uh, in the, behind the telescope up in the upper left, where it says backplane and integrated science instrument module. That is that is where the instruments are, so they are in the cold. And then the, uh, the struts, the, the grayish things that are coming out, what happens is light comes in, in this case from the right, it bounces off the gold mirror, it gets reflected back up to what's labeled secondary mirror, and the secondary mirror sends it down through that hole in the center of the telescope, and it gets then directed from there into the various instruments. So operationally, that's how it works. It's a big, complicated piece of instrumentation. It took many years, more than a decade to build. It is somewhere between nine and ten billion dollars. It is a very big investment by NASA um, into uh, the future of astronomy. Um, and but I am expecting as many big things from this telescope um, as we have seen from uh, Hubble over the last thirty years. Now, Webb will not last probably that long. Um, it cannot be serviced, as I said, by astronauts but it will do, I believe, amazing science. The next slide really is the last one. So for more information, and we'll leave this up briefly as at least as we start the question and answer, um, there are a couple of websites there. Um, Hubble, excuse me, Web will launch on December 18th. That's the current plan. Um, it will show up on the news media undoubtedly. Um, the first images will be released in roughly six months. So think. Christmas for uh, launch and roughly the 4th of July uh, for um, first results. And I know we've got people from other countries, at least from Canada. I don't know what the equivalent's gonna be to think midsummer, I guess. Um, we will have a series of these cosmic explorations coming up. The next one is just two weeks away and that will be up um, on the, the slides um, momentarily. But at this point, um, we will go to questions and answer. Um, I will answer for a while um, and, uh, Thank you for your attention and interest. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kiefer for your thorough presentation. We all enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone learned something new about the James Webb Telescope. So thank you so very much. Let's go ahead You're and welcome. kick it off. Thank you. Go ahead and let's kick it off with the Q&A. The first question here, is, is it possible that this telescope may shed some light on the nature of dark matter or dark energy? Um, okay, so dark matter and dark energy are things that physicists believe are present in the universe. We believe that the visible matter we can see with telescopes is only about five to six percent of all of the matter in the um, in the universe um, and we say that based mostly on our partly on our observations of the big bang um, but also partly on our observations of other um, um, for example we can look at um, galaxies and how fast they rotate at different distances that's controlled by the gravity of the galaxy and therefore the mass 
And we can look at that pattern and say, there's matter out there where there are no bright stars. So that's why we that's where the that's where the notion of dark matter first came from. That was first developed in the early in the late 1970s and in early 1980s. I was an astronomy student at that time, and I swear my mind was blown by that. Um, it is now a, it's been observed so many different times that we know it must be true. Um, so I think we know that dark matter and dark energy do exist. Um, there are enough different types of observations that point us to that. The question is. What exactly is that? And there are different hypotheses. Um, frankly, I think the way we will probably get an answer for that is not from space, but from um, physics experiments on Earth. So for example, the, uh, um, there is um, a, a particle collider called the Large Hadron Collider in um, Switzerland. Um, even if you've never heard of it, you probably heard when they talked about the discovery of the Higgs boson in, in 2014, which it was discovered there. Um, the US nearest equivalent is something called Fermilab in Chicago. Um, the people who run those kinds of experiments are actively thinking, how can they modify their um, instruments to look for signs of dark matter or dark energy? And there are lots of theories, but I personally, I think that's how we're going to get those answers. Now, that's not to diminish the science that Webb will do, because it's going to do a lot of great things. It's just not really targeted at that particular great thing. Thank you. We have a question from the chat that says, um, what is the approximate distance from Earth to L2, the second Lagrange point? And then what is the communication delay going to be between the Webb telescope and Earth? OK. Um, the distance is about, oh, so I said 1.5 million kilometers, that's a little less than a million miles. It's about four times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Um, the, if I remember correctly from Apollo, the light delay to the Moon, it's about one and a third seconds. So four times that, we're talking about five seconds. This is actually not far in planetary terms. It's not to Mars or anything like that, where it's, it can be, 10 or 20 minutes, um, but we're talking about seconds. Um, we, we really don't have to account for any kind of delay at those kinds of distances. And I did see one pop up. I can see the chat, I'm not reading the whole chat, but I saw one that popped up that said, so because we can't repair web um, when it runs out of fuel, what happens when it runs out of fuel? Um, at some point, we stop ability to stop being able to, to use it. Um, much of the turning of the spacecraft, I think, will be done by gyroscopes, but we do need, do need fuel to keep it in a stable location. L2, it's not a perfectly stable place. It's better than most, but it's not perfect. And at some point, the lack of maneuvering fuel will become a problem. Okay, pick up, pick up again where the, where the, I just happened to see that one from the chat, but uh, I'll Absolutely. let you go, Grace, go ahead and, and, uh, and cue me through, through the, the talk. Through the, the totally. question, well, right? thank you. Thank you for taking that question. Um, so we have another question in the Q&A. This one is asking about the LIGO detector. So this person wants to know, um, based on Webb's third mission objective, which is to study the first stars, mm -hmm. how different is Webb's approach versus the upcoming LIGO detector, which is also trying to, well, which is trying to study primordial gravitational waves. Okay, so we have operationally on Earth now in, in New Orleans, just outside of New Orleans and in some place in Eastern Washington, a pair of gravity wave detectors. They have to work together. Um, and um, the L and the I stand for laser interferometry and GEO, gravity observatory. Um, they have to work together because you have to, you have to detect something at both of them simultaneously to rule out these very small vibrations are not a truck passing nearby or something like that. Um, and, and they've been very successful. That, was, that took years, not just years, that took decades to develop. I was at Caltech between 1984 and 1990 that particular instrument was being led then and maybe still today by, by someone at Caltech, not the same person probably, but that's where the leadership was being provided. And they were developing it in the 1980s. 
I think it didn't actually start really becoming productive until 30 years later, you know, 2015 or something like that. But there have been a number of events as now they routinely detect things and the pattern of vibrations in these gravity waves tell us, for instance, about things like um, uh, supernova explosions. Um, and I do believe they are attempting to do that in space, but that is a kind of wave. A gravity wave really is an oscillation of space itself, the actual structure of space. It's not a wavelength of light. It's like everything in space is stretching, uh, stretching in and out or up and down, or I mean, lots of different kinds of modes you might imagine. So it's a different kind of science. And again, it's, it's complementary, um, but, but Webb will do something different. And to the extent that they actually get that kind of interferometer, um, I think it might be called LISA. I think that's the instrument, but I, I may be wrong because I don't follow every nuance of the planetary, excuse me, of, of space astronomy as well as I do the planetary stuff. Um, that's going to be a very hard thing. I, in my sense, it might be actually harder than Webb and Webb is plenty hard enough, um, but we, we can do that from the ground. Um, and you know, I think in space, you, you rule out a lot of vibration sources. Um, you don't have to worry about earthquakes and things like that, or trucks passing by, or whatever. Um, but um, and and they try and they try and dampen those kinds of things out. And obviously, must do a pretty good job. But that's why they want to go to space. But it's a, a again, it's a different um, it's a different way of looking at the universe, which could be supernova nearby, or looking back to the Big Bang, and many different kinds of things. All right. Well, I'm going to pop in for just a second. We're at the hour. So what I'm gonna do is launch our poll. Um, and this is just, if people need to go, need to have dinner, need to go take care of other things, we're so glad you came. Um, at this point, we're gonna continue taking questions with Dr. Kiefer. He's agreed to stay, to stay on a little bit longer. So if you wanna stick around for questions, we encourage you to do so. But if you need to run, we just ask that you participate in these final poll questions and that then you can you can say goodbye to us. So we just wanna know how tonight's program has affected your interest and awareness in the James Webb and its scientific mission. If you feel that you've gained interest and awareness, some, maybe a bit, um, or your awareness is unchanged. Second, um, we'd like to know if you'll be coming back for future uh, uh, series. So we have in two weeks, our second talk about the James Webb, which will be focused on the birth of stars and planetary systems. We hope we'll join you. You can find, we'll hope you join us. You can find that information on our website. And then finally, we'd love to know if you're interested in receiving notifications about these events. And if you are, we can, um, you know, try a little bit harder to get those out to you. So please answer these poll questions. I'm going to leave them up for just a few more seconds. And all right, I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one. All right, so I want to thank you all um, for attending. Like I said, if you need to run here at, at the top of the hour, then goodbye and thank you for attending. If you want to stay on for a further Q&A, um, then we're going to get right back to it. Sorry about that interruption. Follow up with another question. So let's um, have the question from Winifred. It says, what was the major lessons from Hubble and will the JWST be able to build upon those? Oh, Hubble has done so many different things. It would be hard to pick one out. Um, I mean, it has, um, just like if you were to ask somebody, what is their favorite Hubble picture? I mean, I'm not sure I could come down to the nearest dozen you know, obviously I had to pick less than that for this, but but I, I was constrained by the science that was related to, uh, um, in some way to uh, to the James Webb. So I left out, for example, supernova remnants, which are gorgeous things. Um, uh, Hubble has told us so many different things about so many different parts of astronomy that, I mean, it's it's hard to overstate how important it has been, um, and and I think that that Webb will. We'll build on that. I mean, I think, I think for instance, that um, there are things that we have looked at with, uh, uh, with Hubble that we will certainly go back and look at in some cases. The, uh, for instance, 
I will be shocked if at some point in the first few years, maybe not in the first year when they're doing specific types of observation, but at some point in the first few years, if Webb does not go back to the location of the Hubble Deep Field and use all of its instruments to look at the same thing, this exact same point in the sky and get all of those additional wavelengths. Because when you have more than one or two wavelengths, it becomes it becomes a much more valuable data set if you can enrich it with all of those different things. So, so that, that location in the sky, those two or three different locations in the sky have been imaged um, with, uh, with x-rays and by radio telescopes. Um, uh, they've been used to target um, high detail observations of ground-based telescopes. I am certain that Web, that Webb will go back and with all of its instruments, not all at the same time, uh, but with all of its instruments over time, to look at those exact same fields. That is one I'm sure that I can tell you it will do. Um, the, the, uh, the examples that I showed you of star formation regions, maybe not that particular one like um, the Carina Nebula, but there are other ones like the Eagle Nebula, um, the Orion Nebula. Some of those will certainly be looked at again uh, with, with Webb's different capabilities. Um, and, and they will be guided as well by um, ground-based observations. So we know, for instance, that one of the best ways we know now about understanding planetary disks around uh, young stars is something, as I said, called ALMA, which is um, the Atacama Desert Large Microwave Array. Um, it's in Chile. It's up in the mountains. Um, it's up in the mountains because it's very dry, um, which means there's no absorption of the microwaves that you're trying to see very sensitively. It's a large telescope, which gives it a very high resolution. And so it lets us see spatial structure in um, protoplanetary disks. I know 17 of the top 20 of those are going to be targeted by Webb. Um, I'm sure that Webb will target a number of Hubble targets beyond the, uh, beyond the ultra deep field. I, I don't necessarily know which one because I'm not personally involved in any of those programs. But without a doubt, they will be working together. Well, all right, well, thank you. Um, so from an anonymous attendee, they want to know, well, why was Arian 5 chosen to launch Web and not SpaceX? Okay, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. Um, and the answer is that, that Web has been being built for quite a long time, going back before 2010. Um, I'm not sure exactly how far back. And the thing is, at least in the design stages, probably 2003 or 2005 or something like, it's been a long time. And the thing is when you are designing a spacecraft like this, you have to know what you're designing to, what capabilities you're designing to, what the rocket can lift, um, how big the fairing is and how things have to be sized to fit it. Um, it's not just the mass, it's the volume in this case. Um, it's all of the dimensions. Uh, and so, SpaceX didn't have any rockets. The Falcon Heavy, which is the, the big one for SpaceX, um, didn't exist at that point, whereas the Ariane 5 did. And so we made an arrangement with ESA that we would launch using uh, the Ariane 5. Um, and, and then the spacecraft was designed to, with those capabilities in mind. And yes, there is another rocket with similar capabilities now, um, but but that's not what Webb was designed for, and so we we use what was built what it was built for. Follow up question: um, In case people don't know, where is the James Webb being launched from? In, is it in Florida? Okay, good question, Grace. Um, so the uh, European Space Agency has a facility in. Um, I think it's French Guiana. Um, it's now probably independent. It was a French colony for a while. It's um, the northern part of South America. Um, the reason they launch from there is that it is close to the equator. Um, and launching from the equator is a great advantage because as the Earth is rotating, um, to get something into orbit around the Earth is 17,000 miles an hour. And then you've got to go even faster to get out to L2. Um, but the Earth is rotating at the equator at 1,000 miles an hour because it's got to go all the way around once every day. Um, at, as you get further from the equator, it's less distance around the Earth, and so it's not going as fast. So Florida isn't quite as good because it's not, as, it's not moving as fast. So, so the, the Europeans chose to build their facility in 
in Guiana um, because it gave them almost the maximum possible boost from the earth. Um, and so that's the launch facility that they use for everything. And so um, you've been hearing it's, it's now in Guyana, but I mean, there was news over the summer of, well, it's leaving the U.S. on, and it's so big, it's, it's leaving the U.S. on a ship. Um, and it had to go, I think, through the Panama Canal and, um, and eventually it arrived. And, you know, that's where, that's where it's being done because that's where their facility is. Um, our facility is in Florida because it is almost as far south as you can go inside the United States. I suppose you could pick Hawaii a little bit further south, but that's inconvenient with respect to all of our major contractors. So uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida is almost as good as it can get from the U.S. mainland. You could pick, and it has the advantage of you launch over the Atlantic Ocean. So if something goes kaboom, um, and that occasionally happens with rockets, um, uh, it happens over water. You could pick to do that from, say, um, uh, Brownsville or Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, but then you're launching and you're going to fly over Florida or depending. So um, you, you, you get to land sooner. Um, actually, um, is it SpaceX? Blue Origin. I, I'm one of the one. It must be Blue Origin. Um, is um, no, they're launching from West Texas. SpaceX is actually launching things from um, South Padre Island um, out over the water, and so they will um, they will eventually be um, trying to launch things there. I don't think they're it's it's in operation yet, uh, but uh, but but Guyana is uh, happens to be where the Europeans work from. All righty, thank you. Sure. Next question regarding the cryogenic cooling and one of the webs in uh, one of the web instruments. How does one store and manipulate liquid helium remotely? Oh, um, gee, that's an engineering question that I will not claim to know a lot about. Um, that's actually an important skill for, for those of you that are um, in in the audience and your your students. Yes, you have to know the answers to a lot of things. Your student, your your professors are not like to say to take I don't know. Until you get to grad school, when I promise you, you actually do have to say, I don't know sometime because they need to know when you know what you're talking about and when you're just bluffing. Um, and so it is actually an important skill for scientists to know when they're outside of their, their knowledge zone because that way other people who are in their knowledge zone can do it. So my guess would be, and it is only a guess, is that you have to, um, lots of valves, lots of pumps. Um, uh, now this is going to be very, very cold, so you better have the fittings on just so because you don't want it to leak around the fittings as it cools off and contracts. Um, but uh, so I think it's a specialized form of plumbing in essence, um, a type of mechanical engineering. Um, and I know nothing about it, but um, but there are people who, I mean, it's not the first time we've used coolants like that. Sometimes it's liquid nitrogen. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something you have to do. Um, Oh, well, all right. Next question. Does the spacecraft have to slow as it approach and move into the L2 position? Um, you know, it will, it, there, there will be a, a set of rocket firings, you know, one, well, more than one. One will start it going out there. There'll be one or more course correction, mid-course corrections, getting it out there. And yes, you will have to slow down because, um, what you don't want it to do is if, if you just launch it from Earth and it's got enough energy to get out there, um, the Earth will eventually pull it back. So once you get out there, you've got to fire your engines again to, to give it the energy to not come back to Earth. So there are a series of rocket burns that are associated with this. It's not a single one. And um, it will take about a month. It's not a fast process, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you, can, you can pick to be fuel efficient. Um, and and so that's that's the way it will work. Is that it? You know, there are a multitude of uh, a number of, of burns, two big ones, and some course corrections, and they'll they'll take about a month. Awesome. Thank you, Alan, for submitting the question. This also comes from Winifred. Why does the web have five layers of sun shield instead of just one big thick one? Oh, great question. So, um, if you had one big thick layer. Everything is all connected, and the bottom part, as it gets hot, will, I mean, thermal energy is a vibration, and it will vibrate, and it'll vibrate, and it'll vibrate, and it'll, it'll move its way up. It conducts energy, um, basically. That's what that is. And, um, um, I mean, think about, um, 
um, you're, you're pulling something um, out of, you've got a, an oven mitt on and you want to pull something out of the oven. That's, that's fine. That, that thickness is fine, but you don't want to hold it for forever. You certainly don't want to put your hand on the burner um, because after not very long, it's going to be, even if it, even if you're not, even if you don't have to worry about the, the oven mitt catching fire, um, you're going to feel the heat after a while. And so by, by making it a discrete set of layers, you, you're no longer conducting all the way through it in a single thing. Um, but you're forcing the light, the, the energy to go by, um, by photons, by radiation um, from one layer to the next. And it turns out when you do the calculations and the engineers who have done the calculations, I, I'm trusting them because it's, again, it's not what I do. Um, say that the, given the thermal, uh, the thermal properties of this insulation, five layers is what you need to get it cold enough. And that, that gets it cold enough for three of the four instruments. And the fourth one, you'll, you're never going to get it to seven degrees Kelvin uh, with just insulation. So you are always going to have to use some kind of cryogenic cooling. Um, and for the rest, five is enough. And you don't want to use more than you need because that's weight that you've got to carry into space. And if you carry more weight in terms of your sun shield, you carry less fuel or less helium because um, you only have so much capability. So it's in, in, in the space game, it's always about doing what I need for engineering and doing a little bit more for what we call margin, extra capability, but you don't want to over-engineering something so much that you have to give up on something else. So that is part of the trade-offs that they had to do. What did they have to do um, for each piece? And five layers is enough on the sun shield, so you don't need six. Oh, we have one more question, but this is going to be the last one. Okay. So this question is from Alan, who asks, how much data will the telescope collect daily in maybe is it gigabytes, terabytes, and what rate can that data be downlinked? I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. It's, it's, um, it, it is close enough to Earth that the downlink is not going to be a problem. Um, it, it's... You, you know, I mean, some of what's involved here is how long do you have to look at a particular place? So one of the things a scientist, an astronomer would have to do is for a particular target that will have a particular brightness, he will say, um, how long do you think you need to look at it to, to get a good image? Um, and so, you know, different, uh, different targets will have different, um, different imaging requirements. So for something you might need to take eight hours of data and you'd integrate it all together and then sending it down might not take so long. It's, it's the collection time that's the problem. Others you might be able to do more rapidly. And so I actually don't know the answer to that, but given we will be so close to the earth, the downlink time is not really a problem. It's, it's the time it takes to actually make the observations that is the, uh, the limiting factor for what it can do. Thank you. And, and Alan, I think I came across that, like that fact on one of the frequently asked questions pages on webtelescope.org um, or maybe on the, the web page by NASA. So it, that number is definitely out there um, and it's pretty huge, but yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, okay, so we're gonna wrap this up now. We thank you all so much for sticking around, especially Dr. Kiefer for giving us so much of his time. Um, I am just sharing this screen to show you information for the next talk in two weeks, Thursday, November 11th. We will have another speaker who will join us to tell us in more detail about how the James Webb is going to expand our understanding of the birth of stars and planetary systems. So I hope that we'll see you all again. Come back with your great questions. And at this point, we 